Campus Geo. Uh, so my name is Peter Marlow, so I work for CGI. Um, so I've been the technical lead uh, on this project that's been running for just over um, just over a year now. Uh, and joining me as well is Catherine Ratcliffe, who's the project manager. So she's also from um, CGI as well. Uh, and we've been helping create um, basically a digital register of common land in Wales uh, for the Welsh Government. We've got quite a bit to get through, so let's crack on. Uh, so the first bit is what is common land? Um, so common land is land subject to rights enjoyed by one or more persons to take or use part of a piece of land or of the produce of a piece of land which is owned by someone else. Uh, so straightforward. Um, what I want to touch on here is just a few of the kind of um, references and key terms that you're going to hear me use in this presentation that's related to common land and try and explain those um, so you know what I'm talking about when I come to mention them. So the first one is register units. So register unit is the official term for a piece of common land. So within Wales there's lots of common land um, and the term to refer to an individual piece of that is a register unit and that usually has a reference as well say for example CL 120 that would be the unique reference for a piece of uh, common land within Wales. The second point here is, is dominant tenement so not to be mistaken for the famous actor who played Doctor Who and so dominant tenements or we usually refer to them just as DTs so these are the people that own the rights um, so they own the specific rights over common land and they typically tend to be farmers um, and then lastly we've got the rights of common so these are these detail the specifics of the rights so for example grazing 10 sheep um, so kind of in, in conclusion you have dominant tenements who have one or more rights of common and those rights of common apply to a register unit which is a piece of common land so in terms of a bit of background around the project itself. Um, so obviously there's the, the Register of Common Land exists at the moment in its paper format. Um, each local authority in Wales has its own version of, the, of their register um, that they maintain and that's open to the public at the moment um, but obviously in order for people to come and see it they have to book in with their local authority, arrange a time, you know, physically come to the offices um, you know, and open up, open up the register and, and, and find the bit that they want to take a look at. Um, and so ties in a little bit with point two there which is time consuming so also that isn't a quick process you know in this day and age people expect to see you know information after a couple of clicks uh, on the internet so part of this making it digital um, will allow the public for the first time to be able to access all the information to do with common land in Wales you know online um, you know no restrictions they don't need to go to their local authority and request time they can see it all um, online which is you know fantastic and again, on the second point there for the time consuming, uh, where there's disputes in common land, where, where, rights, where those rights apply, or um, well, the details of those rights, but often they end up resulting in kind of legal cases, and that takes a long time to resolve, um, especially having to go back to look at the physical registers, um, trying to determine who changed them and, and what change they made. Uh, and that feeds into the third point there, which is the register maintenance. Um, so by making it digital, um, it's, not just allowing the public to see that information uh, but actually all of the local authorities will be able to maintain that register digitally going forward and that will be the official legal register um, and as part of that this system is recording um, all of the changes that are made so this full audit history so we're recording who who made the change why they made the change and what they actually changed um, and that's really important in these in these legal cases to to determine you know what action should be taken so the fourth point on there, which is about the physical state, so obviously, as I mentioned, they are paper-based at the moment. They're quite old, um, so, you know, they're starting to deteriorate. Um, we'll have a look in a minute at some of the state of the maps um, and, and the kind of damage that's happened to them. Obviously, by digitising it, we can, you know, make it last forever, essentially. We don't have those issues um, of, of uh, deteriorating over time. And the last bit on there is the data sharing. So it's really critical um, that when we digitize this data we can make it available to other departments within Welsh Government or other organizations outside of Welsh Government and obviously at the moment that's almost impossible to do because each local authority has their own uh, register you know it's paper-based if you wanted to get a Wales century view of um, common land in Wales you know, it's really tricky to do at the moment because you have to 
call off to lots of different local authorities. So just a quick look at some of the numbers here. So there's 22 local authorities in, in Wales. As I mentioned, each one's got their own register. Most of these registers are kind of more than 50 years old. So they're old documents. Um, in terms of the quantity um, of maps, you know, we're looking at about 12,000 map pages, 25,000 register pages, around 70,000 uh, land and right entry pages. So that's a lot. Um, but I think the point I want to make here is it isn't really a big data project. We're not talking about millions of records that we need to process here. Um, but the challenge is more in the quality of the data that we're trying to uh, transform. So on this next slide here, hopefully you can see that in some detail. So this is some example uh, register maps as they are now uh, in the paper-based register. And you can kind of see hopefully from this that, uh, you know, some of the quality is not not fantastic, you know, obviously these maps have been drawn on, you know, hand drawn to try and denote the different boundaries um, and where edits have been made. Sometimes they're kind of on top of each other, pretty difficult to determine, uh, you know, where the boundary starts and where the boundary ends. And the same is true of the register pages. So here we've got a couple of examples. So this is the textual content of the register. So the, the rights, we can see here that they are handwritten. Um, if they get voided, then obviously they just get crossed out. Um, and in a lot of cases, uh, normally in pencil, where they've done an update kind of in line, um, it's quite tricky to, to decipher the kind of changes that have been made here. Uh, and what's the kind of real um, legal version of it? And the hope is that by digitizing this, we can standardize that. So there's just one way to create a, a right and one way to record uh, common land in Wales. So without further ado, let's jump into the application. So I'll come out of here. So hopefully you can see this on my screen. Okay, so what we've got here is the application is in two parts. So this part I'm gonna show you first is search the register. There's also manage the register. So this is the screen that um, the public will be able to see. So anybody can come on and, and start uh, using this service. Um, and we can see here, there's a couple of options uh, that we've got to find this common land data um, because obviously we're phosphor G and we all love maps. Uh, we're gonna use the by location search. Um, so I'm just gonna search for my favorite village in Wales or favorite after starting this project. And what we can see here is that's brought me up, brought up a map for me um, and it's centered on that location in Wales. Uh, and we can start to see some of the register units that are in green and the dominant tenements that are in red. Um, and we've got some of the textual information around those on the side here. So I'm just gonna go into full screen because you know, bigger maps are always better. Um, and at this point, I'm um, obviously in Wales and I can just kind of zoom around and, and I'm free to go and look around and, and you know, look at um, common land and dominant tenements kind of anywhere in Wales at this point. I'm not restricted um, by that initial search. And this is, uh, this is test data. So this is on our test system, but a lot of it's indicative of, of real, real data. So I'm gonna come back here now and just come back to CL120. Uh, and if I hover over this, I get this pop up and it allows me to drill in and, and see more details for this register unit. So if I select that, I'm now on this second map page. Now this is a, a page that's kind of centered on this specific register unit. So we can still see that register unit in the bottom right here. Um, and now we can see a couple of dominant tenements. And the important thing about this page is it's focused on this register unit and just showing who has rights over this register unit. Um, so it's only showing the dominant tenements that have rights. So if I scroll down a little bit, you can see some of the tabs here and you can see the, uh, an example right of, right of common um, that exists. So this is in the kind of formatted standardized version of this. Uh, so we can see they've got the right to graze as the type um, and we've got the subjects that they can, they can graze. We've also got, just as a temporary measure here, we can see the original text as it was in the register before it was transformed. Uh, so these are the original five columns from the register with their original data. So I think the, the bit that's, that's interesting here is column four, which contains the details of the rights. So we can see here, that's basically just a big kind of block of text, um, you know, paragraph of text. It's difficult to query that, it's difficult to break it down and do a lot with that. Um, whereas in the new format, you know, it's split out, we split out the, the type of right, which is grays, and we split out the numbers and, and the subjects of that right, uh, which means, you know, going forward is much easier to query that and, and 
get an idea of you know how many grazing rights are there uh, in Wales, which you know you just couldn't do um, in the paper form, or even just taking the paper form in its current format and putting it digitally. So if I come back up to this map here, I'm not constrained again. I can start zooming around as well here if I want to get it slightly closer in. Um, and we can see some of these purple polygons uh, boundaries. So those are deregistered areas. So they were bits of common land. And uh, for one reason or another, they're no longer common land. Um, and the last bit I want to show you on this public side is just this notion of um, what we've kind of termed as, as hopping. So at the moment, obviously, I'm centered on this register unit CL120. Um, but if I want to change my context and say, actually, um, for example, this DT30, uh, where else does that DT have rights? Um, which other bits of common land does it have rights? And I can actually select that from here. And the context is updated, the map's updated. I'm not sure how, how good the video quality is there in terms of the, the frames per second, but it's a smooth transition that's brought that map out there. And it's now showing me that actually this dominant tenement has rights also over CL13 that we can see up in the corner here. And the actual list of rights has, has been updated to be specific to that dominant tenement. And that I'm not stopped there. I can carry on doing this kind of hopping. So I can say, okay, who's got rights over CL13? And I can select that as well. Um, and we can see in this case, quite a lot of people have rights over CL13. Um, so it's just a really good way of, um, you know, initially placing your some, yourself somewhere, looking at a certain bit of uh, common land and then just being able to kind of continue your investigation, continue your search into it and, you know, keep jumping and looking at rights and looking at different bits of bits of common land. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly go into the admin side of the portal. Uh, so this is the local authorities that would sign in to make changes to the register. I'm just going to sign in with my government gateway account. And this is a test government gateway um, service. So there's no need to try and write down my access code. It's not a real uh, access code and it's definitely not my pin number. So now I'm in, we can see now that the screen is talking about managing the register. Uh, what I can do from here is I can select update the register. So there's quite a few steps here, different paths through. I'm gonna kind of skip most of these because they're not really relevant to what we wanna show here. Um, and get to the bit where we can see some maps. So I'm gonna select the register unit that we saw previously, and I'm gonna to select to create a new rights entry. So I'm gonna keep these details the same as default, and I'm gonna start filling this in here. So now that we've kind of normalized it and standardized this data, um, it's, it's meant that we can select stuff from drop downs, which is much easier to obviously create rights with. So I'm just gonna say that they can graze 10 cattle, you know, I could keep adding rights of common there as well. Um, I'll just add that one for now. So now I need to put in the rights description. So this is a description of the dominant tenement. So who, who are the rights attached to? And what's important here is I have to put it in English and in Welsh. So obviously the system itself labels the screen. It's obviously available in Welsh, but the actual register content as well will also be available in Welsh. Um, and that's a big plus. So the register as it is at the moment, it's paper format, it's only available in English, um, but the digital version will be available in both English and Welsh. So that's a massive bonus for Welsh speakers. So I'm just gonna put in the dominant tenement name, in this case, the name of a farm, and I'm gonna to select to digitize this dominant tenement. So here we've got a map again, and we can see my register unit if I zoom in a bit. Um, we can see we're getting master map data back as well. Um, I've got these extra controls on the side here that, that are going to allow me to digitize this dominant tenement. So the first thing I want to do is just turn on this Epoch 2 data. So the dominant tenements, a lot of the time, their descriptions are just um, field numbers. Um, and obviously in modern versions of master map data from Ordnance Survey, those field numbers aren't included anymore. Um, so what we've done to aid the digitization process is we've processed the Epoch 2 data and we've loaded that into, into GeoServer and we're serving that up basically to allow them to overlay that over the up-to-date master map data and to allow them to capture uh, dominant tenements based on the field numbers. So I'm gonna to select to create here. I'm just going to tweak 
transparency a little bit. Um, and I'm also going to select a snap. So this is snapping to the, the underlying master map coming from Auden Survey, so not obviously to the um, epoch data because that's just raster. And the master map data here is actually a, it's a vector feed uh, WF, WFS coming directly from uh, via Europa, which is really nice. So it means we don't have to host that or manage that. It just you know, comes um, to us. And that's because the Welsh Government have got a public sector mapping agreement that allows them to have access to that, which is very nice. Uh, and I just want to quickly show you these other tools that we've got here. So we've got this reduce, polygon and combine. And basically what these let us do in a lot of cases, it's necessary to kind of cut holes out of the geometry. Um, if they're bits that aren't common land, you know, they've installed an electricity pylon or, or such. Um, and there's cases as well where they would need to kind of do the opposite and, and fill them back in. Um, so they've got the tools to be able to do that. Um, and lastly, I just wanted to show very quickly, um, if I kind of edit this now and move that boundary so it's over the register unit, which is the green boundary, um, I get this warning come up telling me that you know the dominant tenant boundary intersects a registered area. Um, so what we do is we put kind of validation rules in and there's lots of these for the other layers as well. It kind of help the user uh, guide them to be like, okay, the update you're making might not be uh, strictly correct. Now in this case, it's only a warning because the data that we're transforming into the digital register, some of that data is already gonna have these, already gonna have these inconsistencies. So we don't wanna be too strict um, because the person making that update they might not be able to um, you know make a decision as to which is the right way to go um, but we've we've got a raft of those kind of updates um, those validation about, rules to help them you got about five minutes peter okay thanks um, so that, that's showing me digitizing um the dominant tenement so that's fine i've done that i come back to here there's lots of extra information i could put in here but it's not really relevant to what we want to show today so I'm just going to submit that. So that's gone in. I can view that update. And as we can see, I'm back to this page again. And hopefully, you know, you can see that DT that I created is there. And the right that I put in is also there as well. Cool. Okay. I'm just going to jump back into the presentation quickly. So... In terms of what's, what are the benefits that open source geo has given to this project that we put together. So obviously we've mentioned before, um, we're using geo server, um, that's super fast WMS. So one of the things I absolutely love about geo server is the performance of that. Um, so we've kind of seen that on the big map there, bring about those register units, bring about the dominant tenements, um, you know, really performant. Uh, the OGC standards that has out of the box. Um, so we touched on that earlier as well. It's, it's critical that although this register of common land, it, it's in charge of managing um, that data within Wales, but it needs to be able to share that data with other systems, um, other departments. Um, and hopefully you caught the Data Map Wales uh, presentation from my colleague Pascal earlier today. Um, and that's a great example of uh, a system in Welsh government that will be able to um, you know, harness this data and display it within their system as well. So although they won't be the owner of it, they won't be able to update it, but in a read-only capacity, they'll be able to get you know, common land geometry and display it in their portal, uh, which is really critical. And the last bit, um, a little bit more technical, but because it's open source, you can kind of get under the hood of it and diagnose um, any issues you can get into the code, you can debug it. So we didn't have any issues on our project, which is great. Um, but just knowing that that, um, that option is there is, you know, is a great place to be. Uh, so the second part is open layers that we're using. So obviously that's a very powerful comprehensive web mapping library. Um, in our case, you know, we could tailor that to the specific application needs. So some of those uh, geometry validations, some of the um, geometry alterations that we were making and the kind of zooming in and out, changing of the context, you know, OpenLayers allowed us to do all of that, um, you know, pretty seamlessly. Uh, and the last bit there, we're using that in combination with JSDS, uh, which is the library that allows us to perform those fairly complex uh, geometry operations, um, you know, cutting holes out. Um, and we could have used turf.js as well. Um, you know, those two are pretty interchangeable. So I just want to highlight one of the challenges we had because you know, always have challenges. Um, and we were using, obviously, we were using SQL Server um, as the database management system. That was the preferred option from Welsh government, um, mainly down to security. Um, but obviously that isn't 
often the first choice um, of database when you're working with spatial, usually it's Postgres, um, PostGIS. Uh, so that creates some issues just because it's more difficult to find help articles and documentation on that. Um, and we did have some bugs, we had to put some workarounds in, um, you know, just because uh, working with spatial and SQL servers is a little bit less um, mature uh, than some of the other alternatives. But in the end, the effort was justified. Obviously, we have it working now. Uh, and what that's really given us is the ability to use SQL Server, Azure SQL in, in, in particular, uh, which, you know, if you're hosting your application in Azure, um, you know, SQL Server has got the, the best support. It's got the best level of functionality, the different services to do with scaling, um, you know, security, uh, availability, all of that stuff. You know, SQL Server within Azure is is the best at that so it's, it's given the application access to that which is which is fantastic okay the last bit one i just touch on so we are deploying this application into azure could probably do a half hour talk just just on that but i just want to pick up two points um about how we are doing that that's maybe slightly different to um how other people are so the first bit is how we are building this so the application is really in two parts so it's the portal application uh, so that's written in dotnet core um, and then obviously we've got geo server uh, that's serving up the uh, GIS information that's obviously in Java, you know, two different languages, two pretty different um, applications. Uh, but in this case, they're both built with Docker um, and they're both deployed in containers using Ubuntu. Um, and that gives us a bit of parity essentially um, in that build process, even though they're both very different. And then how do we actually deploy that up into the cloud? Um, so we're using, uh, within Azure, there's an app service um, and that's their kind of PaaS uh, platform as a service. Uh, and within there, there's the option to use web app for containers, which is what we're using. And that basically allows you to take those containers and deploy them up into Azure as web apps. Um, and that is obviously a managed service from, from Microsoft, from Azure, and that helps with things like availability, and scaling and, and security, um, particularly on the SSL side, where I don't know if anybody's tried to do SSL and GeoServer before, sometimes that isn't straightforward, can be a bit of a nightmare. So anything that helps with that, you know, is, is, is really good. Okay, so that, that was it really. I know that's a little bit of a whistle-stop whistle tour um, going through it, but I'm hoping I've covered, you know, most of the stuff and certainly how the, the open source geo elements have, have really enhanced, um, enhanced the solution. Thanks very much, Peter. That's that's great. Yeah, we've got a few questions that uh, have come in, so I'm going to go straight on to those and, and run through through those. We've got uh, eight or nine minutes, I guess. Uh, so first of all, from Victor about base mapping, saying asking what base map did you use, and was uh, can OpenStreetMap attribute data be included in the database? Is there any element of crowdsourcing in this project? Okay, so yeah, good question. So there's no element of, of crowdsourcing. So in terms of the base map that we're using, um, so it's the standard um, ordnance survey uh, master map and, and the base map as well. So that all comes from this SPAR Europa service that we have access to. Um, so that provides us with a base map, but also provides us with the uh, vector geometry for master map, which is what we stack to um, on the admin screen. Cool, thanks. And uh, the next one is from David. It says, hi, Pete, fantastic project and presentation. The question is, have you used these technologies in other projects? And if so, what are the main issues you've faced with the technologies? I know you mentioned some issues with SQL Server, for example. Yeah, so that was certainly one of the bigger ones and just because a lot of that was un unfamiliarity. So yeah, a lot of our other projects that we've run is usually post, you know, Postgres or, or post GIS if you're working in the spatial domain. So SQL Server did provide a few issues there. Probably the other big change for this project is it's all, um, it's all in Azure um, and it was using web apps. Um, so that's slightly different, um, perhaps different to what's normally done and especially in terms of Geo Server. So taking Geo Server and hosting that um, in a web app, uh, there was some stuff that we had to do configuration wise to get that and to work because you've got a little bit less um, control when you uh, deploy it into a web app. Um, so although obviously Microsoft takes care of some of that scaling and um, you know availability, but in terms of getting getting behind the scenes, looking at what GeoServer is doing, there's a little bit more configuration you have to do there. Um, so I think those are probably the two the two main points. Um, especially on the SQL Server side, the geometry. So in native SQL, 
um, we take that and we obviously transform it back into uh, kind of GeoJSON WKT so we can work with it in the browser uh, within open layers and that kind of transformation back and forwards. There was a couple of um, there was a couple of gotchas there that, um, that we had to be careful of. Cool. Um, the next uh, next one is a, a comment really from Dave who says he had no idea that common land wasn't digitised in Wales. So he says back in the day in 2004, Natural England. And, um, sorry, I'm naturally I've lost the end of my um, naturally mapped all common land in England. So it's you know getting one up for England there. I think. Yeah. So I mean, the thing to mention there as well um, is that as far as we sh as we're aware, certainly in the UK, maybe even worldwide um certainly in terms of taking common land and building a digital register um wales seem to be the first in in the uk at least to to do this um so we know in england obviously uh you know they don't have a digital register and the, and the same with scotland so they might have the common land geometries digitized um but this is kind of a full service that allows them to completely manage their registers and basically get rid of the um, you know, get rid of the paper-based ones, you know, put them in the National Archive, um, but they don't need to rely on those. It's the legal thing anymore. It's all totally digital. So I think, I think Wales are, um, they are leading the way. Okay, so, so uh, one. actually one up for Wales, in fact. <laughs> cool. Uh, and then the next one, um, so Tony asks, aren't vector tiles generally simplified? And, and so how does the snap to vector data work with respect to that? Um, so yeah, so at the moment, the way that's working is the actual, um, the raster imagery that comes back, um, that still comes back as raster. We still get that master map back as raster. And then what we're doing is we're loading um, the WFS service for the vector data. Um, and we're kind of loading that in, but we just don't show it. So it kind of sits underneath um, underneath the raster. Uh, and then within open layers, you can, you can basically give it that kind of vector um, vector layer and say, you know, snap to this. Um, and so obviously in this case, because both of those sets of data are coming from the same provider, they're kept in sync. Uh, so as far as the user is concerned, there's no, um, you know, there's no difference there. The raster always represents the, um, it's always in line with the vector, but what it meant was we didn't need to, um, we didn't need to manage that. So we wanted to avoid having to take the master map data and, you know, put it into geo server and, and do all the styling and that kind of stuff. Which is, which so is quite so it's not point. simplified at all, the vector data? No. No. Okay. Cool. Uh, another question from Aiken. Um, has Wales got a digitised brownfield map? Do you know? I do not know. Sorry. Okay. Somebody else might know. Um, okay. A couple more questions. They keep coming in. Uh, this one from Ulrich. Um, not really a geo question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. How was the textual content captured and how was the transition to the legal acceptance of the digital data to the, to, uh, from the paper maps managed? If that's clear. Uh, do you want to answer that yeah, one, I was Catherine? Say, do you want me to take that? Yeah, so um, essentially um, each page and each map um, was scanned in. So we've got some scanners going around Wales, um, literally scanning in the pages, and then they use um, OCR, so op character recognition to take the data they can and handwritten data is actually manually typed um, so a very very long long process um, which we're still undertaking to be honest um, and then basically they're linked to the maps with sort of you know unique keys which obviously put into the database so, and it, that's so how that's it done. And that'll be going on for another year <laughs> So is it legally accepted now that the digital data is? So not yet. Um, it will go through um, the local authorities consultation, um, which will happen over the next uh, 12 months. And then it will go to public consultation, which is uh, spring 2022. And once that's happened, um, then it will become the legal register. Okay, cool. So I've just got one more comment here, which is batting back for England. Um, so Sarah says, Rural page, Payments Agency England maintains a digital record of the common land register for the purposes of inspections, which yeah. can be accessed by the public on request. So, uh, Who knew? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> just don't tell that's, Wales. Yeah, just to get <laughs> They're very proud of uh, thinking they've beaten England. <laughs> so so we'll, we'll leave that one.